My name is Mikko. Thanks for coming. And thanks for coming back to normal life. After all this time, it's such a great time to see real people in real building with uh, a real conference. And I've spent the downtime, the pandemic time, thinking about how the world has changed as I've been writing a book about this. My book just went to print, and in that book I I think about the multiple waves of technology revolution. You see, this time is such an exciting time to be alive. The world has never been changing faster as it is changing right now. Technology has always shaped the world, but it has never shaped the world in such a fashion as is happening during our generations. If you imagine someone being alive 500 years from now and looking back at us and looking back at our generations looking back at our time The most important thing he would say about us is that we you and me We were the first people who started living their lives Both in the real world and in the online world. That's Who we are. That's how we will be remembered we are the first people in mankind's history who are living on the internet. The mankind has walked this planet for a hundred thousand years and then internet appeared during our time and internet will be part of mankind's future forever. This change is just happening right now, which is really great and it's really awful. Internet is the best and the worst thing that has happened to us during our lifetime. Yes, it's giving us all these massive new opportunities, all this new business, all this new connectivity, all these new types of entertainment. It's great. I love the internet. But it's also totally changing the way we expose ourselves to risks. It has killed privacy. It has enabled unlimited amount of criminals who couldn't reach us before the internet now to reach us through the internet. Before the internet, crime was different. If you look at statistics, for example, well, I live in Helsinki, Finland. In 1991, there were around 400 bank robberies in Finland every year. Today, there are no bank robberies in Finland. Like, why would you rob a bank? Banks don't have any money. There's no cash. In First of all, there's no banks. Second of all, there's no cash in banks. Banks do get robbed, but they get robbed online. That's why we have banking trojans and credit card theft and all the other types of online crime, which affects banks. Crime used to be local. It used to be the people from that city or from that country who were doing the crimes in that city or in that country. Before the internet, if you were hit by crime, it was someone stealing your wallet or breaking into your house and stealing your television or something like that. And those criminals are criminals from your city. You don't have to worry about, I don't know, car thieves from Venezuela flying over to Poland to steal your cars. They don't do that. They've never done that. And they, they never will. However, you do have to worry about online criminals from Venezuela or from Brazil or from Ukraine or from Vietnam. They do target victims anywhere on the planet. So internet is as if someone would have given free plane tickets to all the criminals of the world. The people who couldn't reach you can now reach you. And this change is happening so quickly, it's hard to understand how, how the world is changing. So, I was born in 1969, which means I'm older than TCP IP, the protocol, which was invented a month or two after I was born. 
So if you ever wonder how old is the internet protocol-wise, it's this old. I'm as old as TCP IP. Um, I started my professional career by joining a small technology startup company in my hometown of Helsinki in 1991, which is pretty much exactly when the web was invented. So halfway through my, through my life, the internet had already been there, but nobody was really using it. And then around the same time when I professionally started working with computers, the web was invented. It took several years for web to become a thing. Most websites were created, first websites were done in 1994 and 1995. But nevertheless, the technology has shaped the world very quickly from that point on. Revolution of internet, of mobile phones, of online connectivity, social media, all of that. Now, 30 years later, I'm still working at that small Helsinki-based startup, which has grown. It's no longer a startup. It's, it's over 30 years old now. Now we have 1,700 people working in 40 countries around the world, but I'm still working at the same place. And that gives me a unique viewpoint into how, well, first of all, how the company, how, how F-Secure, the company where I work, how it has changed over 30 years. Also, how the world has changed, how computer security industry has changed. But most importantly, I think the big, biggest change I've seen is how our enemies, how the people who try to attack the services online have changed, how criminals, cyber criminals have changed. In 1991, when I started my career by reverse engineering malware, the malware I was analyzing looked like this. Like this is the, the kind of problems we faced in 1991. Viruses in 1991 were spreading like biological viruses. This floppy is infected by a, worm, uh, a boot sector virus called stoned, which would only spread from one computer to another when someone would physically carry an infected floppy and insert it into a computer. Then it would infect all the other floppies used in that computer. And when someone would carry one of those to another computer, it would spread. So the only way for stone to spread from one country to another is that somebody had to travel and carry, physically carry the virus with them. Sort of like biological viruses. People have to physically travel and move around to, to, to distribute the infections. So, so the spreading speeds of early computer viruses were pretty much the same as spreading sp speeds of, of human viruses. Everything changed when we started using email and the web and we started getting email worms and online worms and online exploits and all that. So the internet enabled a massively faster spreading speed for problems that we face. And it actually is multiple waves of technology revolution which is happening right now. The first wave the internet wave took all computers online and that wave is already history that has already happened the first wave of the internet revolution is behind us you see today all computers are already on the internet every computer you see anywhere it's online if you find a computer which is not on the internet there's a reason why it's not on the internet 99% of computers are connected online. That's the first wave that's already happened. Now we are in the middle of the second wave. And the second wave is then taking everything else online. First wave took all computers online. Second wave is taking everything else online. Everything will be online. And no, I'm not only speaking about smart devices like IoT revolution, smart televisions and smart cars and smart watches. That's pretty obvious. This wave has been going on for a little while already. No, I'm speaking about something bigger. Everything will be online, including the stupid devices, not just the smart devices, but also the stupid devices, the kind of devices 
where the users or consumers or the owners of these devices that they don't want those devices to be online. They don't get any benefit for those devices to be online. If you use a smart TV, it's nice. I mean, you can watch Netflix from your TV because it's on the internet. So the consumer likes the fact that it's online. Or if you drive a smart car, let's say you have a Tesla, it's actually really nice that you have a mobile app and you can, you know, heat your car into winter from your phone before you get into the car or cool your car in the summer from your phone before you get into the car. It's nice. You get benefits for having your car on the internet, for having a smart car. So let's think about stupid devices, the kind of devices that you don't want to be online. You don't want an app for the device. I don't know, a kitchen mixer or a kitchen scale. Like you don't need your kitchen mixer to have an app. Like why would you need an app for that? You don't need an app. You don't want that to be online. And what I'm saying is that even kitchen mixers will be online. Not to give benefits to you, the consumer or the owner of the device, no. They're going to go online to give benefits to the manufacturer, the company which builds these kitchen mixers. Why would they want their kitchen mixers to be online? Because they've learned that data is the new oil. Data is the new oil. We want to collect data because it's valuable. Valuable how? Well, valuable, for example, by knowing where your customers are. How many kitchen mixers did we sell in Europe last year? Which countries bought most kitchen mixers? How many mixers were sold in Poland? To which cities? Where in Poland are our kitchen mixers? Where in Warsaw are the kitchen mixers we sell? Do we have more customers on the east side of the city or on the west side of the city? And if there's more customers on the east side, maybe we should advertise more on the west side. This is valuable information. Data is the new oil. Also information about how well do their kitchen mixers work, how often do they have problems, how often do their kitchen mixers catch fire, things like that. Valuable information. It's valuable, but it's not very valuable. So it's, it has to be pretty cheap to connect these kitchen mixers to the online uh, networks for them to do this. And these connectivity kits are not cheap enough yet. Basically, when you connect a kitchen mixer to the internet, you need a connectivity kit, you need a chip, and you need a connectivity plan. Right now, that would cost you a couple of euros. And if a kitchen mixer is sold for 10 euros, you can't actually add a connectivity kit which costs 3 euros. It's going to be too expensive. But, as you know, technology gets cheaper and cheaper. So in 5 years or 10 years, the price of that chip and the connectivity kit is going to be five cents or three cents or two cents or half a cent. Eventually it's going to be so cheap that they can do it. And then all the kitchen mixers on the planet will be online. Every kitchen mixer or any other appliance you buy will be online and they're not even telling you that they're online because you don't need to know. It's not online for you. There's no app, there's no functionality, it's only giving information to the vendor who built it. And also, you can't prevent it from going online. You can't block it from your Wi-Fi, because it's not using your Wi-Fi. It's going to the internet using 5G or 6G or Zigbee or Sigfox or any of these other technologies that we're building. Everything will be online. This revolution will happen whether we agree or not, whether we like it or not. We don't have a say in this. They, everything will be online. So eventually, anything that we plug into the electricity grid, we will also be plugging into the internet grid. If it uses electricity, it will be online. And this is relevant because any new technology that we innovate, if the innovation is good enough, if it's useful enough, eventually we don't want to be without it. In fact, eventually we can't be without it. Let me explain this to you. Let's think about some older innovation. Right now we're speaking about connectivity and, and internet. Um, let's think about something like 
electricity. Now today, of course, everything runs on electricity. I'm speaking to you over electricity right now and showing slides to you using electricity. We don't even think about electricity much anymore at all because it's so built into everything we use. We think that it's been around forever. But electricity hasn't been around forever. Most cities got their electric grids around 150 years ago. And sure, 150 years, it's a long time, but it's actually not that long of a time. Because during these 150 years, we have become completely reliant on electricity. If power goes out, when there's a blackout, of course, nothing works. But typically, blackouts don't last very long. So it's okay. You know, if power is out for 10 minutes or an hour, you know, it's okay. We'll just wait and it's, it's, it's going to be good again. Because if power would be out for long periods of time, we couldn't function as a society. So imagine something catastrophic, like a massive sunstorm, which would cut power on the whole planet for 10 years. Well, our societies would not function, because without power, we couldn't do anything. Our factories would not run. We wouldn't be able to communicate we wouldn't be able to move around. Your car might have a gas, uh, gas tank full of gas or a battery full of power, but when you're out of that, you can't refill the car because gas stations don't work without electricity. And of course, you can't recharge your car because there's no electricity. Even the power generators running on diesel would run out of diesel because you couldn't get more diesel because there's no electricity. Factories wouldn't run, we couldn't feed our people, people would start dying without electricity. That's how reliant we've become of electricity, and that's exactly what's going to happen with connectivity. Internet is going to become exactly as mandatory as electricity. Eventually, when there's an internet cut, an internet blackout, it's going to be as drastic as a power blackout. In fact, as I explained to you earlier, because everything will be online, one day we will see a day where an internet connectivity cut is also going to cut power. Like if we have a loss of connectivity, then we won't have electricity either. Of course, today it works the other way around. If we have no power, we won't have connectivity. It's going to be both ways. Losing either one will also make us lose the other one. Sounds far-fetched. Yeah, right now it is, but this will happen. This is going to happen. Connectivity will be as mandatory as electricity. Today, when we have an internet blackout, it's mostly just being expensive or it's a nuisance. Yeah, we can't send email or we can't use our mobile apps or maybe our company can't sell things online, which is expensive. You know, we'll live. Factories continue operating. You can still move around with your car even though there's no internet. But eventually, none of that will work. Eventually, it's going to be as bad as losing power. Another thing is going to happen when we look beyond the, the near future. Internet itself is going to disappear. It's going to become completely invisible. It's going to become something we don't even think about. Eventually, internet will be available everywhere on the planet with massively high bandwidths for free. Eventually, internet will be available everywhere on the planet for any person and for any device for free with massively fast bandwidth. If not literally free, then practically free. Which means we will always assume that there will be connectivity. Every device we carry, everything we buy, will always assume that they can always get online. And when that happens, then internet doesn't exist anymore. We don't think about it. Nobody is going to say that I'm going to go online, because you are online always. It's sort of like air. We don't think about air. Like when you travel to another city, you're not thinking that, I wonder if there's going to be air there. You, you know there will be air. This is what internet will be like. It's going to disappear. It's going to become invisible. It's going to be built in. You assume it's going to be everywhere and every device will do the same thing. 
Another thing which is going to happen in the long run is that computing will be unlimited and free. Again, it, this is going to take a while, but imagine something like AWS or GCE or Azure available for every person and every device and every application anywhere on the planet with unlimited resources and it costs nothing. If not literally nothing, then practically nothing. What could you do if you had unlimited computing available for you with no restrictions, no limits? It's a pretty empowering thought and this will happen. Also, we will see a time where storage will be unlimited. Everybody can store unlimited amounts of data for free. So think about this. Unlimited free connectivity, unlimited free computing, unlimited free storage. This is the future where we, where we had it, headed at. If you look at the direction where we're going, this is the direction where we're going. And that's a pretty powerful vision for future. I mean, I think we will be able to do great things when we are not restricted by connectivity or limits of computing or, or limits of storage or for the fact that we have to pay large amounts of money for any of these. It's all becoming cheaper and faster and bigger. And then we will face the third wave of the revolution, which is going to be things enabled by machine learning, things enabled by artificial intelligence. The first time I heard about artificial intelligence was when I was reading a technology magazine in 1983. I was 13 years old and I read this article about artificial intelligence describing how you could build systems that learn and then use that learning in the operation of the program and about how the, the massively um, massive computing capability of futures computers will enable artificial intelligence which and this is from the article from 1983 which will one day be so powerful that computers will be able to beat the best chess player on the planet and when that happens, then we know that now computers are smarter than human beings. That's what they wrote in 1983. I remember reading this and think that, wow, one day computers could beat the best chess player. That's really wild. And of course, that then happened already in 1997. It's pretty obvious that today computers can beat us in any game. Of course. It wasn't obvious in 1983, but it's obvious right now. And when that actually happened, when computers actually beat humans in chess, we sort of moved the goalposts and sort of decided that, you know, that's not actually intelligence. It's just a very fast calculator. That's not really intelligence. So we sort of keep moving the goalpost because it's quite clear that computers are much, much better than humans in narrow applications like games or searching the internet or, I don't know, recognizing patterns but they are not better at us better than us in general intelligence tesla's self-driving algorithm is pretty good in driving a car but it can't do a painting google's search algorithms for internet are pretty good for finding information but they can't drive a car. So they're narrow applications. They can only do that one thing. That one thing they do better than humans, but they can't do everything we do. Will they ever be able to do the things we do, like everything we can do? I don't know. And I don't know if anybody's even thinking or trying to do that. It's not really necessary for us to build general intelligence for most of the things we're trying to build, but for the sake of argument, Let's, let's think about this. Could we one day build a computer which would be smarter than humans? And even more importantly, every human would agree that yes, this is now artificial intelligence and it's smarter than us. So what would we have to build 
so that then everybody would agree that, yes, that thing is smarter than humans in everything. Well, how about, how about building a human brain simulator? Like a massively large computer which would simulate every single neuron um, and every single synapse human brain has, so it would be able to emulate exactly the human brain operation. This is very, very hard to do. There's been some academic projects estimating whether we could do this, but I suppose that one day, far in the future, we might have the computing capability of simulating the whole human brain. It seems doable eventually, looking at how everything, how storage is growing and computational power is, is growing. I think it's plausible that we will be able to do this. And that's interesting, because if we believe at all, even in theory, that we can simulate the whole human brain, then the question changes. Then the question becomes that, okay, I wonder if we're able to do that in the future, or have we already done that in the past? Because if we're able to simulate the whole human brain, then how do we know any of this is real or a simulation which has already been done in the past? Which is sort of pretty sky, science fiction or sci-fi idea, but, but you get my point. So I do believe that eventually computers will be able to beat humans in anything, which is scary. And it's the kind of thing that fuels many of the science fiction movies. And the whole idea of introducing a superior intelligence into our own biosphere seems to be a basic evolutionary mistake. But whether that's going to happen anytime soon or in our lifetimes remains to be seen. So for the near future, for the next 30 years or so, I think we'll only be seeing narrow applications of, of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. But even there, we're going to see drastic changes. Many of you use GitHub. Many of you have played around with the GitHub Copilot. GitHub Copilot is an example of a program which can write programs. This is not a hard challenge. I remember writing the first program which was able to write other programs already years and years ago. Granted, the programs it wrote were really bad. They sucked. They were programs and you could compile them and they were written by another program. This is doable. And when you, when you look at the advancements in there, eventually programs will be pretty good in writing programs. That's a very narrow application of machine learning and artificial intelligence, but importantly, one day they will be able to optimize themselves. So basically you take a program and you tell the program that, you know, rewrite yourself, make yourself better, optimize your functionality, make yourself better and faster and, and more functional in every way. And then that new program does the same, which then does the same and it does the same. And we end up with exponential curve. After 15 seconds, we have no clue on what the hell this program is now doing because it's rewriting its own code. So programs will bypass humans as programmers with their programming skills one day. And that might be during our lifetime, which is a really exciting and a really scary thought. It's scary thought, especially because it would make all of us unemployed. Programmers would no longer be needed, which sucks. It sucks to be unemployed. But why would anybody hire human programmers if you can get the programs written by other programs. The same thing would apply to other narrow fields of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So let's say journalists, at least the kind of journalists which just sit behind the keyboard and write stuff, investigative journalists who go on location, we still need those. But other journalists would all be out of job. They're, they're no longer needed because their job can be done by a program which analyzes all the information and writes articles which are better than articles written by human beings. And of course, then they can do the same thing in all human languages in 10 seconds, all that. All poets will be unemployed because computers will write better poems than humans. Poems which will touch us deeper than any poems written by any human poets. 
And this feels bad. The fact that automation will make people with skills that we think about as human skills unemployed because they will be better in that than we are. But this is not the first time this has happened. Whenever we have quick technological change, it will make people unemployed. I was speaking about the electricity revolution of 150 years ago. Let's go even, even further back. Let's think about the revolution of artificial power. The revolution of artificial power around 300 years ago. Before that, all the power we had was in muscles. Muscles, our own muscles, or maybe in muscles of animals. We were using animals for power, like using horses for moving heavy things around. Then we invented artificial power. First, the steam engine, and then a bit later, the electrical engine. And artificial power made a lot of people very, very unhappy. Because artificial power made a lot of people unemployed. Before artificial power, if you were building a house, you needed a lot of people to carry the bricks around, to carry the bricks to top floor so you could build the house. You needed a lot of power, muscles. Then we invented artificial power and those people, the brick carrying people were no longer needed. They could be fired. And the brick carrying people hated the idea of artificial power, of course. But I think we as a whole, we would all agree that artificial power was a good invention for us, for, for mankind, for humans. Inventing artificial power made us better. And the fact that a lot of people got unemployed because of that invention was sad, but still it was a good thing to do. And in fact, many of the people who's, who were making their livelihood by carrying bricks around went on to do more creative things, better things. They used their time for something more productive. Maybe they got a new job which didn't involve something which could be replaced by artificial power. And this same thing will happen, well, I hope, will happen with artificial intelligence. All coders will be unemployed, which sucks. We will hate it. But maybe we can then use our time for something which cannot be replaced as easily by computers. And we're already seeing some examples of this happening today. I have a friend of mine who was the CTO for a company which was building smart trash cans. Yes, smart trash cans. Think about the, the big trash cans a city uses. The city of Warsaw has 100,000 trash cans which are being emptied by these trash trucks which drive around the city and empty the trash cans. So they built these sensors. They called this the Internet of Bins. You put these sensors inside the trash cans and they would automatically connect to the internet and measure how, how filled up the communal trash can is, the location of the trash can, the, the, how, how hot is it, and things like that. Which means then the city could optimize how to run the trash trucks, which route to take, how often do they have to empty it. There's no point in emptying a trash can if it's empty. And then you see that this full trash cans over there, we have to go there today optimize the routes instead of driving around the city five days a week now you could drive through the city two times a week and get better results excellent it's good for the environment it's better for consumers everybody wins well not everybody you see when this company started deploying these internet of bins these sensors in the first cities they were surprised because the sensors started coming back to them broken they were getting much more broken sensors than what they were expecting because they really had built really sturdy sensors so they could be inside a trash can for 10 years. And they started coming back broken and they couldn't figure out why until they started looking at security camera footage and then they learned that it was the drivers of the trash trucks which were coming to trash cans and beating these sensors into pieces because they hated the sensors. Why? Because before the sensors, they would have a job five days a week. After the sensors, they would have a job two days a week. They were rising against the robots, basically. Human uprising against the robots. That's what was happening already a couple of years ago. That's an example of artificial intelligence making people unemployed. And this is now coming into our world.
Now we, who work in computer security industry, we've been using machine learning for quite a while. First machine learning project we started at F-Secure uh, was in 2005, 16 years ago. 16 years is a long time, but you know, security companies were sort of forced into using machine learning technologies because machine learning was absolutely needed for us to stay up to date. There were so many attacks coming in, so many new samples to be analyzed that even if we would have a, had an army of researchers, we couldn't keep up uh, with the amount of analysis work we have to do. So we started automating it. So today, basically all security labs run um, not fully automated, but largely automated. We automatically search for new attacks. We separate samples to be automated by, uh, to be analyzed by automated systems. We automatically figure out if this is a new attack or if this binary is a bad binary or a good binary. We automatically create detections. We test them automatically. We ship them automatically back to customers. And this is how security companies work today, have been working for years. And when I speak about these technologies with journalists, a very, very common misconception is that they believe that the enemy, the attackers, would be using machine learning as well. And I tell them that, no, actually, we're, we haven't seen that. We haven't seen online attacks which would use AI. And very often they argue with me, that, no, of course we have, it's happening already. And I tell them, no, it's not, it's, it's not happening, not, not, not yet. And then they argue, no, no, we, I've, I've read about this, I've read all these things about this, it, it is happening. So what I've started doing is that I give them a metaphor. This is a Volvo XC90. Imagine that you buy this car, really nice Swedish, really safe car. You drive it home, you park it in your parkway, then you go bragging to your neighbor about your new car. Hey, I bought a Volvo XC90. Pretty nice. It's the safest car on the road. Really, really safe car. If you get in an accident in a Volvo, you're likely to survive. In fact, it's unlikely that you will end up in a crash in this car because these cars crash less than other cars. And your neighbor completely disagrees. He says, no, 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 you're wrong. These cars don't crash less than other cars. These cars crash more than other cars. And he can prove it to you. And to prove it to you, he goes to YouTube and shows you videos of crash tests. And now you are both correct. You are correct. It is a safe car. He is correct. These cars crash more than other cars because Volvo does more crash testing than other car manufacturers. But these are the kinds of crashes that don't make you less safe. These are the kinds of crashes which make you more safe. And this is what's happening in the world of attacks using artificial intelligence. There's tons and tons of papers and research and articles about things that could be done by attackers using machine learning like malware with self-modifying code, or phishing attacks which learn how to avoid uh, detection. But that's all academic research or industry research. Like we do a lot of research in this ourselves. We do research into what could be done, what bad things could be done with machine learning so we would be better equipped to react when they actually happen. But that's not real attacks. That's crash tests. So how can I tell you that we haven't actually seen machine learning fueled attacks yet? Well, the most likely thing attackers would do with machine learning is that they would replace the back ends of their malware campaigns, which are right now being run by humans. They would simply replace those humans with a simple program which would learn what to do. It's so easy to do that it will be done soon. It simply hasn't been done yet. So, typical malware campaign today, like ransomware operation. They are sending out the malware, typically over email, not always, but let's say it's over email. They're sending out emails to tens of thousands of addresses with a malicious link. Whenever, whenever somebody clicks on the link, then they will end up getting exploited by a website which will drop a Windows executable and infect your system. 
These guys running this operation are sitting behind their computers, sending out the email and watching how well does it work. Like, how well are our malicious emails going through? Or are they getting blocked by operators or telcos or spam filters? And when they're getting blocked, they will modify the email and make sure it, it works better. Then they're seeing how well does our malicious link uh, hit the end user's computers? Are they actually seeing it or is it being blocked by a security program or by a firewall? And if it's being blocked, they modify the email to make sure it goes through better. Then they look at the success of the actual binary, the malicious program. If it's a Windows system, the Windows EXE. Is this getting detected and blocked by intrusion prevention system or by endpoint security? And if it is, let's recompile the program. Let's change the code. Let's make sure it works better. This is now done by humans, but obviously this could be replaced by a computer, a, a learning system which would see how we, security companies, how we react. And when this happens, it will change the game so drastically that we would, of course, see it immediately. Because right now, 50% of this picture is automated. The attackers do manual attacks send them and we automatically detect them and respond to them with machines. So our reaction is very quick. Their reaction is very slow because it's done by humans. So it's ga a game of ping pong. They send pings to our court and uh, we reply with a pong immediately because it's automated. Then it takes a while and then we get a new ping and pong comes back uh, immediately. When the pings are automated, then it's going to be ping pong, ping pong, ping pong like this. And the rate of the, the speed of this exchange is going to explode. It's going to be very, very visible to us when this happens. And it hasn't happened yet. The only thing that can beat a bad AI is a good AI. And we will end up with this arms race when the change happens at their end. So is it going to happen? Well, yes, it is. When will it happen? Well, I don't know, but it does remind me of this. This is a cartoon we did five years ago. Yeah, that's me. Five years ago, I invented a term called cybercrime, sorry, cybercrime unicorns. And then we did some research on this. We did a white paper on this. We, we did a comic about it as well. I don't remember why, but we did. And the title of the comic was, Will We See? A cybercrime unicorn. Now, unicorn is the term we use for private unlisted companies which are valued at over 1 billion US dollars. Back then, I was thinking about Spotify, Uber, and Airbnb. They're no longer unicorns because every single one of them has gone public. So now they have real valuation. Unicorn is the term we use for unlisted private companies where we estimate the valuation. And if it's over 1 billion USD, then it's a unicorn. So the question I had five years ago was that would we one day see cybercrime gangs, which would be unicorns? Cybercrime gangs, which would be worth over one billion dollars. Five years later, I can give you the answer. Yes, they exist today. They exist for two reasons. Reason number one, ransomware operations as well as business email compromise operations are making more money than ever before. Reason number two, five years ago, we already had a lot of cybercrime gangs which had millions of dollars, not billions, but millions of dollars. Now, ransomware gangs and other cybercrime gangs like to keep their wealth in cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin or Monero or Zcash, because it's untrackable and safe. As long as they keep their wealth there, they won't be caught. So that's where they like to keep it. Five years ago, we had plenty of cybercrime gangs which were holding 20,000 bitcoins. Five years ago, a bitcoin was $500. So if there was a cybercrime gang worth $10, $10 million, they were holding 20,000 bitcoins. If they are still holding them today, when one bitcoin is $50,000, well, 20,000 bitcoins today is 1 billion USD. So all they had to do was just to sit on their wealth. And now they would be a unicorn. So cybercrime unicorns exist. They've appeared over the last five years. And that changes the things cybercrime gangs can do. 
Now they can afford to invest into their attacks. This is why we now see ransomware gangs with professional support departments, which will 24-7 answer questions to their, to their clients, also known as their victims. They run their own data centers. They run their own financial people. They are operating like any organized crime gang. They can also afford to invest in the attacks themselves. When we look at, for example, the Kaseya supply chain attack, which we saw two months ago, that was done with the zero day. We believe it's highly likely that the gang, Rivil, the Russian gang behind it, they bought the zero day from the zero day market. And these are expensive. They cost you millions. But if you have a billion, of course, that's just an investment. They're investing more into the attacks so they can make even more money. And what I just said about artificial intelligence and machine learning, the main reason why the attackers haven't started using machine learning yet is that the people who have the skills to program machine learning systems don't need to go into life of crime. Most of the online criminals we find are programmers who had programming skills but were living in faraway places where it's hard to make a nice living or to become rich with the skills you have. So they decided to go into life of crime because they could become rich with the skills they had over there. In many parts of the world, you don't have to do that. If you're a programmer and you're living in San Francisco, you don't have to become a cyber criminal to make a lot of money. You can get hired by Google or Apple and make a lot of money. Why would you break the law if you don't have to break the law? Now, right now, this applies to machine learning people. Machine learning experts don't need to break the law to make a lot of money because there's such a lack of people on the whole planet for people who can write artificial intelligence systems that you, if you have these skills, you can make a really nice living without breaking the law. Enter cybercrime unicorns. Now they can compete with legal businesses for the attention of machine learning specialists. They can pay 10 times more if they want to. This is the kind of development we really don't want to see happening in the world of, of cybercrime. The more we have examples of criminals making lots and lots of money with their attacks, the more newcomers we have on the field, the more people we see Instagrams of online criminals driving around in Ferraris or in Rolls Royces, the more people we have thinking that, yeah, I want to do the same thing as these guys are doing. I want to go into life of crime. The good news is that sometimes these kind of criminals do get caught. This is arrest footage from Dubai from last year as law enforcement is catching Mr. Raymond Abbas, the guy who you saw posing on the Instagram pictures with his Rolls Royces. He had made his money with business email compromise attacks and money laundering involving online attacks. But the more we are able to catch online criminals, the, the more we will show to potential newcomers into the field that crime doesn't pay. Here's another example. This is footage shot by the Ukrainian law enforcement as they're investigating reports about a hidden uh, Tor Onion data center hosting the leak sites for ransomware gangs. And as they follow the lead and investigate this building, they find this hidden switch. Then when they click the switch, they realize that this building has a hidden floor. Clicking on the switch opens up a hidden floor, and then when they research the hidden floor, they find a hidden door. When they open the door and investigate further what's behind the door, they find a data center. So if you ever wonder where the Tor Onion leak sites are hosted, that's where they're hosted, in, in places like these. Another example of the work being done by Ukrainian law enforcement is as they follow the lead to an affiliate of the Conti ransomware gang. The lead leads them to this building. They go and do a knock-knock on the door. Knock-knock, are you in? Can we come inside? And then when they go inside, they find, well, this is what, how cybercrime billionaires keep their money, either in cash or also in precious metals. 
I first thought that these are gold bars, but then one of our analysts told me that no, this, this is actually silver. That's what silver looks like. So it's not as valuable as you think, but it's still pretty valuable. So it's interesting to see that they're not holding all their wealth in cryptocurrencies. All of it actually goes, all, uh, some of it actually goes back to currencies like these. Or holding it in physical wealth like silver. And it's not just the fight that we have to face with cybercrime gangs and criminals. Today we also have to accept the fact that more and more of online activity, offensive online activity, is being done by nation states. Being done by intelligence agencies, by militaries and by governments. Governments writing malware. It's pretty interesting and pretty far-fetched thought, but this is exactly the world where we live in. Some of these attacks are espionage, some of these attacks are sabotage. But today, all governments are interested in not just defensive use of cyber power, but also offensive use of cyber power. Cyber weapons work. Cyber weapons are effective, affordable and deniable. Cyber weapons are effective, affordable, and deniable. They're effective, they get the job done. They're affordable, they're cheaper than traditional weapons, and they are deniable. You can deny it's not your weapon. A weapon which is effective, affordable, deniable is a pretty good weapon. No wonder governments are interested in this. And then we have the challenge of governments harboring online criminals or not doing their part of work in catching online crime gangs. Crime gangs have been avoiding victims in their own countries for years and years. They know that it, it's, it's a good business sense to target victims in faraway countries. Don't hit people and companies in your own country because then local law enforcement will come after you. Only target people in faraway places and local law enforcement will leave you alone. This has been the norm. But now we might see change coming. So let me play you a video clip from President Joe Biden. I talked about the proposition that certain critical infrastructures should be off limits to attack, period by cyber or any other means. I gave them a list. If I'm not mistaken, I don't have it in front of me, 16 specific entities, 16 defined as critical infrastructure under U.S. policy, from the energy sector to our water systems. Of course, the principle is one thing. It has to be backed up by practice. Responsible countries need to take action against criminals who conduct ransomware activities on their territory. Responsible countries have to take action against criminals who conduct ransomware operations on their soil. Very true. And we have actually now seen a little bit of change happening in this space. And Russian and other law enforcement from countries where ransomware gangs operate from have been more active in cutting down these operations. But we don't believe any of the big ransomware gangs like Rivil or Ruik or Conti or Dappelbamer would be linked directly to Russian government or any other government. We believe they're crime gangs which just are operating from countries where they have been left to operate fairly freely because they haven't been targeting local victims and local companies and local enterprises. So this is the world where we live today. We are living in the middle of multiple waves of technological revolution. Slowly but surely, our societies are becoming dependent on connectivity, just like we have been dependent on electricity. The internet is the best thing and the worst thing which has happened during our lifetime. It has brought us so much good, but it's now bringing us all these new risks. Not just risks of crime, but it's also slowly but surely making all of us unemployed as well. And we used to worry about just securing computers, but as everything is now becoming a computer, we're no longer just securing computers. We're securing the whole society. 
And rarely is anyone thanked for stopping the disaster that did not happen. So let me thank you for doing your part in stopping disasters so they will never happen. Thank you for your work and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much.